So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Judson Reed. He is a specialist with the Cornell Vegetable Program and team leader for Harvest New York. He is the state lead on high tunnel vegetables and um, is coming to us from Yates County. So welcome Judson. Thank you. And thanks Carla and uh, CCE Delaware and the Watershed Council for organizing the conference and inviting me to be here. I'm happy to be here. If there's any problems with my audio at any point, um, Carla, please let me know. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we have about an hour to cover our topics this morning. Is that correct? So probably what I'm going to do is, is break that up into a couple of two 20 minute chunks um, and uh, hopefully allow ample time for Q&A at the end. Um, those two 20 minute chunks that I was asked to speak on are high tunnel fertility and then potential crop rotations within a high tunnel. Um, bearing in mind how those rotations contribute to fertility, um, which ultimately depends on soil health. And so um, let's dive into it. Um, to begin with, we have to think about our soil from a nutrition standpoint in terms of what are the crop needs that we're going to be addressing. And all soils contain some basic levels of nutrients. We divide those into three major categories. And this isn't a hierarchy, but the macronutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, followed by secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and then our micronutrients, boron, iron, manganese, etc. Now, any one of those nutrients, if they're restricted, can interfere with crop health to the point of causing us losses, yield loss, etc. So the micronutrients are called micronutrients simply because the quantity that they're measured in is in parts per millions within the plant versus the macronutrients, the secondary nutrients, we're measuring those in percentages. But if I have a shortage or an excess in any one of those categories, it becomes a limiting factor. Don't think of this as the hierarchy of which of those nutrients are uh, most important to us. Now I mentioned that all soils contain the basic levels of these nutrients because the ability of the soil to deliver those nutrients in sufficient quantities over sufficient time is critically important in high tunnels or heated greenhouses where we're growing indoors um, and we're growing very intensively. Our crops are high yielding and oftentimes we're growing year round. So the ability of the soil to deliver these nutrients is um, particularly under pressure compared to outdoor cropping situations. So given those basics, uh, these are the nutrients that we need to work with within our soil. We have to have some understanding of the physical uh, makeup of our soil. And soil is broken down into the following uh, three basic units, sand, silt, and clay. And the percentage of your soil within those different categories is very important in regards to how you manage it indoors and the soil's ability to deliver nutrients. And this slide shows the relative um, surface area or size of those different particles. So if we look at clay, for example, it's extremely small relative to sand. And so what that means for crop nutrition is that clay, given volume of soil, so that clay, since it's a smaller surface area in the same volume of soil, say you have a meter or an acre, whatever unit of soil you want to look at in terms of volume, the clay particles have more surface area to bind nutrients for nutrients that I just mentioned to attach to relative to sand. Now there's other challenges that come with each one of those units of soil. For example, sand can be very droughty, clay, uh, is prone to more prone to compaction and other issues. There's not a right or wrong here. It's a matter of we need to know what we're working with. The next important piece of information we need for managing high tunnel soils is our pH. What is going on with our pH in the soil inside of high tunnels? So this is a chart that shows plant nutrient availability across the spectrum of pH. Uh, the left 
left-hand side of this slide being very acid, the right-hand side being very alkaline or basic. And most of our plant nutrients are going to be available on the acid side, somewhere between 6 and 6.5 is ideal for most vegetables. What happens when we're growing indoors is that our pH tends to move to the right of this chart. Why? It moves to the right for a couple of reasons. One is the water that we use oftentimes has dissolved limestone in it. We call that bicarbonate, calcium bicarbonate. It's also um, referred to as alkalinity. Most water in New York State and surrounding states has elevated levels of calcium bicarbonate in the soil. Like liming your soil, if you understand what lime is, the high tunnel or greenhouse doesn't allow any natural precipitation in. We tend to add a lot of water, which means we're adding a lot of alkalinity. That alkalinity pushes our soil pH to the right hand side of this chart, which means nutrients become less available over time, and managing that pH becomes critical inside. If we're producing an agricultural crop in the watershed, we need to be very mindful of our nutrients. So here's a, here's a, a bunch of fertilizers, about 10 bags. For starters, they're not stored properly. And that's an environmental threat, a human health threat. But also this is a signal to me that this grower is really chasing fertility. We don't need this many different types of fertilizer we're growing inside of a high tone. Really, if we're maintaining the soil viability through crop rotations, particularly cover cropping, which I'm going to get into later, we can get our fertility program down to hopefully one or two bags, whether it's conventional or organic. That's another conversation, and I will address it. Um, but growing inside does not mean that you need this many fertilizers to address all of those crop needs. How many do you need? Well, you don't know unless you soil test. Here's one of my coworkers taking a soil test in one of our research high tunnels. And I would say again that the, the production is so intense inside that soil testing is a natural annual practice. Outdoors, I think we can get away with maybe testing once every two to three years. Indoors, it should be every year. And my preference is that the soil test is taken in the fall. Why in the fall? because the soil is still warm, biology is still active in the soil, and so we get a better snapshot of what's going on nutritionally there. Furthermore, if I need to react to nutrient levels in the soil, if I do that in the fall, I have time before a spring crop for whatever I'm adding to the soil to react to the soil. For example, sulfur. Sulfur is a common addition in our high tunnel cropping cycles because we need to lower the pH oftentimes, and sulfur does that for us. However, sulfur, like lime, takes time to react. And so if I apply it in the fall, then I have time for that to react for a spring crop. How much sulfur to use? You don't know unless you soil test. So soil test every fall is my recommendation in height. Where do you send that? There's many labs you can work with. I prefer soil tests to go to Agro One or Theory One in Ithaca. And the reason I say that is that the lab is affiliated with Cornell University. It's a private lab, but it's affiliated um, with a soil science department on campus. And they work off of historic data on New York soil. So each um, soil in the state has a series name and that series name has been studied, and the lab knows how well they respond to management fertilizer. So let's see, where am I going with this? Okay, we we get a soil test, it comes back. Now for high tunnel growing, one of the first things I'm gonna zero in on are what are my calcium levels and what is my soil pH? Those are, are critical um, levels to monitor particularly that pH. Again, I said I wanted to be in the low sixes. This test comes back uh, in the mid sevens. Now this is a logarithmic scale, which means that I am actually a long ways off from where I want to be in terms of pH. 
Also, you'll see down here in this uh, bottom row, soluble salts, a value of 1.1. I won't go into a lot of detail there, but generally I want to be below two. Soluble salts is a measurement that's important for high tunnels or any indoor growing because those salts tend to accumulate over time. This is not a problem for soils in the Northeast United States um, outside, but inside we should add a soluble salts test. It's only $5 addition to your regular uh, test. So now that I have this back in the fall, I can begin to make decisions in terms of what do I need to add? I'll probably need to add potassium in this situation, particularly as it's low relative to calcium and magnesium. And I'm gonna add sulfur to get my pH down. Here's another uh, sample test. This is a real test from a, a high tunnel I work with. And over here to the right, I want to point out this value. It's percent OM. OM stands for organic matter. And organic matter, generally, we're trying to move that upward. And if we think back to the soil particles that I showed you, sand, silt, clay, we can improve the way that those particles bind together we call that aggregate, aggregate stability, with the addition of organic matter. That organic matter could be composted manure, composted leaf litter, cover crops, etc. However, with some of those organic additions to our soil, we see that our pH continues to creep up. Here it's 7.9, and our calcium, also nearly at 9,000 pounds, is also getting too high. The phosphorus here, well, this is a nightmare, uh, particularly for those of you who are concerned about protecting water quality, which hopefully we all are, but particularly when you're in a critical watershed, this high level of phosphorus is a threat to water quality. I'd rather have that figure way down under 50 pounds per acre, and instead I'm at close to 1,000 pounds per acre. So this is where we need to avoid adding excess fertilizer to our high tunnels, whether that's in the form of a all-purpose fertilizer, say a triple 20, which is 20% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, 20% potassium. I may need that first number, which is the nitrogen. I don't need all of that phosphorus. And over time, this is what happens. That phosphorus gets out of whack and we have a bad situation. Not only is it an environmental threat, a water quality threat, it's also a threat to crop productivity because high phosphorus restricts the uptake of other important nutrients, namely potassium. So if your number one high tunnel crop happens to be tomatoes, you will find out very quickly, if your phosphorus is too high, your potassium is gonna be restricted and you're gonna have poor quality fruit. So the best way to deal with this is to not let it happen, is to be preventative. And so when we think about fertility issues, we should separate out our nitrogen from our other nutrients. Now, nitrogen is often the nutrient in greatest demand by our vegetable crops. So in organic situations, we tend to pre-incorporate that in a bulk material because we have less soluble material that we could run through a drip irrigation system. So those sources of nitrogen for organic fertility pre-plant would include soy meal, alfalfa meal, feather meal, or even blood meal. I mentioned potassium. There's a fantastic organic, organic fertilizer called sulfate of potash. That's a 0, 0, 0,052. So it's 0% 0 nitrogen, 0% phosphorus, and 52% potassium. So if I focus in on my nitrogen and my potassium, generally I'm not going to have to add a lot of phosphorus, if any at all. I can add rock phosphate or bone meal as sources of organic um, phosphorus. But I, in, in high tunnel growing, my fertility often comes down to nitrogen, potassium, and managing my pH because the other nutrients tend to build up and accumulate. There are increasingly soluble forms of nitrogen available to organic growers. Here's one that's based on soy. And it's a 14% water soluble nitrogen. So I can inject this through a drip system. I can describe that in detail if people have questions. My challenge to you is 
to look at the cost of these materials and what are you paying per unit of nitrogen. We also have liquid micronutrients that are also injectable now for organic growers. So we're really seeing some great advances in the availability of soluble organic material. For conventional growers, we also have a lot of materials that exclude phosphorus as well as magnesium where we can, and also calcium from my point of view. So urea is a classic example of this. It's a 4600. So I'm not adding any additional phosphorus, which is a good thing. I'm not adding any additional calcium. Remember, I said we get most of our calcium through our water. Calcium nitrate is an option where you have low, low calcium soils. Um, sodium nitrate might be a possibility, although you have a salt concern with that. And then potassium nitrate, which is a 13044. The commonality between all of those materials, the middle number is a zero. After we've done our soil test, we also want to foliar test. So a foliar test is just that. We snap off some newer vegetative growth, send that into a lab, and they tell us what is the nutritional status of that crop. High tunnels for us are, are high value. And so foliar testing is a way for us to make sure that our fertility program is on track. We like to do this every few weeks during the growing season. Uh, there's a number of commercial labs that will do this for you. Um, I work with one called Waters Ag Lab. I do prefer um, a separate lab for this personally. Um, we send these uh, samples in and then we get back a set of results that hopefully looks better than this. But this is a nice, <clears throat> excuse me, easy to read chart that shows where I am for my nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And if I'm in that red zone, I can react. I can add one of those soluble materials that I just shared with you to the irrigation system and test again in a couple weeks. And generally I can see a response within that time frame if I'm adding soluble materials. Um, I would rather be up in the green for those first three letters. Remember I said those are our critical macronutrients. Good. This be a good time to stop you for a question that related to what you just uh, talked about. I think so. That was my first section, so I'm I'm almost on track, which is amazing. Excellent. Uh, let's okay. Do, so, let's do how questions. does using rainwater instead of groundwater change the chemical makeup in a high tunnel? Great question. Um, so so, uh, rainwater is going to be lower in alkalinity and pH. Um, so the quick answer is it will be better <laughs> if you have a way of storing sufficient rainwater and delivering it. It's generally superior as an irrigation source to groundwater because again, that groundwater has uh, too much alkalinity in it. It also has a lot of hardness to it, which we measure as um, magnesium and iron. So rainwater is great if you can deliver enough of it. All right, so now I'm going to transition to the um, crop side of things here. That was a crash course in, in high tunnel soil nutrition and, and somewhat input focused. Now I want to talk about what can we grow that will keep the soil healthy and also provide us hopefully with enough economic returns. So this is a, a, a pre-recorded version. I'm still here live if there's any questions. Uh, and Carla, I'm going to again rely on you to let me know if there's any issues around uh, sound. You bet. Major categories today. Those are economics, pest and disease management, soil issues, and labor issues. So let's get started. Thank you, Judson. As we move through this discussion about crop rotations in greenhouses and high tunnels, we're going to use some of the major opportunity crops to guide us through that discussion. There are many more that we could include here, 
but some of the big ones are tomatoes, cucumbers. I'm going to include hanging baskets in our discussion today as a, as a potential source of revenue in high tunnels. They could be with petunias or another flowering annual. And I know some of you may be saying, well, that's interfering with light or contributing to disease, diseases and insects. And you would be right. The question is, can we grow this crop, generate some revenue and not interfere with our, our other crops uh, while managing those risks? We will of course be talking about greens. Uh, winter greens could include spinach, kale, arugula, many different types of Asian greens and mustards. I'm going to use the word greens today to refer to all of those crops that we grow in the cool or cold season. I'm going to include ginger in our discussion as well. This may be a new crop for some of you, uh, but it's one worth considering due to its very low labor requirement and high value and considerable yield inside of a high tone. Ginger is grown in the soil, and you can see here there's a single bed of ginger. The reason I included this image is that ginger or any other crop I share with you, you could think of it on a per bed basis instead of a whole tunnel basis if you're not able to market an entire tunnel of ginger or any other crop that I'm discussing here today. You can take our, our conversation and apply it to a single bed. I wouldn't suggest reducing it to less than a single bed due to management. Uh, however, anything I say today, such as ginger, think about on a per bed basis if a per tunnel basis is too much. Now that said, if you're a uh, small, if you're a mid-sized vegetable farm that has maybe half a dozen high tunnels, perhaps you could grow a whole tunnel to ginger and it would fit very well in certain rotations. Cover crops are another important part of our discussion today as a rotational crop. They don't have a cash value associated with them, but I'll make the argument that they do indeed have an economic contribution to the high tone or greenhouse. The question is what cover crops can we grow and when do we grow them? Here we have buckwheat being grown next to a tomato crop. There was a tomato crop where that buckwheat was uh, just several weeks before this was seeded. I'll also suggest we think outside the box of what can be grown inside. And we've seen some very good success with tillage radishes grown inside as well. So to begin to make these decisions on what a rotation would look like, we have to look at when can we grow certain crops. And so our limiting factors are temperature and light in terms of when we can grow certain things. For example, tomatoes in my part of the world tend to be grown from mid-April into the early fall. The assumption I'm making is that there are no light inputs and low to minimal heat inputs. With additional heat and light, we can grow just about anything, but we might not be able to afford to do so. So again, a working assumption here today is low input greenhouses or high tunnels. Cucumbers occupy a shorter window. They need warm soils and warm temperatures. Ginger needs uh, also warm conditions, but has a longer season uh, than cucumbers. Then we have our greens crop, which traditionally we're growing from uh, early fall or late summer into the late winter or early spring cover crops, the petunias or hanging baskets have a very short window in early spring. Generally, we're marketing those by the end of May. I also have a line here for basil. Uh, basil is a high revenue crop and has the advantage that you can interseed or interplant basil between fruiting vegetables uh, and generate a fair amount of revenue there uh, while really not taking up a lot of space. Now for each one of these crops, we have to think about what is the revenue that it generates. And I have on the right hand side of the screen here, some sample gross revenues for the different crops. That gross revenue is calculated simply by total marketable yield 
times price. And I'm doing that in a 3,000 square foot space, just as a typical unit. And the figures I have here are all based on university research, most of it from New York. I'm not saying that they are the um, only uh, revenue that you could generate from those crops. Yours might be more, yours might be less. In fact, it probably will be more or less than this. Uh, but again, these are research-based figures and really just kind of starting points for us to discuss these crops. So we'll be, let's work through some of these rotations and we have annual rotations that I'm gonna go through in the next several slides. And what we can begin to think about is building multiple years together by connecting these annual rotations that I'm sharing with you. So the first one is the classic one and probably the highest revenue generating one we'll see is tomatoes and greens. So tomatoes going in the ground in mid April. And then we have this conflict that the greens need to go in the ground uh, by the end of this, uh, September or we see significant yield loss. Uh, and so tomatoes probably are gonna have to be terminated before they're fully done ripening fruit. We do have some risk of, of pests here, thrips, mites, and aphids, and this system is very hard on the soil. There's a lot of tillage involved, there's a lot of extra nutrients involved, and there's no, very, very little organic matter going back to the soil. Many people think that they can work around this simply by adding compost. Our experience is that adding compost year after year is not a sustainable practice because we are, we are imbalancing pH and a number of other nutrients over the long term. So I'm not against compost in any way at all, but compost as a substitution for sustainable crop rotation uh, does not work from our point of view. So let's look at that tomato rotation, tomato greens rotation with a cover crop. So now I've lost about $6,000 in revenue by taking out the greens, um, but I still have a fair amount of revenue out of that same 3,000 square feet. I've reduced my insect disease pressure, particularly insects, uh, for example, aphids, by having cover crops in compared to winter greens. So those cover crops, they're improving the soil physically, biologically, and nutritionally, they're making a contribution to future crops, reducing the amount of fertilizer that we have to use in the future. Those cover crops, we have to think about the planting date very similar to our winter greens crop. Every day that we delay moving out of late September, our planting of cover crops, the less biomass we're going to get. You'll notice there's a brief window between the cover crops and the tomatoes, and that is to allow the cover crop to decompose to some degree before we transplant tomatoes. So this is a way to maintain revenue while making some contribution to soil health. Another step towards soil health would be getting away from a fruiting vegetable and looking at ginger. So ginger, needs to be planted even later in the year than tomatoes. I would suggest maybe mid-May, it depends on your own soil conditions. And then again, we run into a conflict with greens that need to go in mid-September. The ginger may not have reached its full maturity in our high tunnels by the time the greens crops needs to go in. This is a very high revenue situation. The combination of ginger and greens a very low pest and disease situation. So this is great if we need to break up uh, diseases. It's a moderate labor situation. Ginger is a low labor crop compared to the fruiting vegetables. The greens, of course, are a high manual labor for harvesting. There's no soil improvement in this situation per se, but it is less demanding on the soil than fruiting vegetables. What if I were to take that ginger crop and add a cover crop to this. Again, I lose around $6,000 in revenue from my greens, but now I'm in an extremely low pest disease rotation. 
So if I need to break up pest and disease cycles desperately, but still maintain some revenue, ginger and cover crops works quite well. And this is an excellent soil building opportunity. Going back to fruiting vegetables, let's look at cucumbers, which occupy a smaller calendar window than tomatoes, but still have a very good economic performance for total revenue. If I combine cucumbers and greens, now I have a little bit of breathing space between the cucumbers and the greens. The cucumbers go in later than the tomatoes due to their um, intolerance of cold soils. They come out earlier than the tomatoes as well. That gives me a working window here to get my greens in and out in the uh, spring, or I could allow those greens to go deeper into the spring. I do have significant pest risks in this situation. Aphid, mites, thrips um, could all easily move between these crops. And again, I'm not making any contribution to soil health with my cropping rotation here. However, if I bring in cover crops, now I have a greatly reduced risk for pests, which may be a good thing considering how vulnerable to pests cucumbers are in particular. Uh, my revenue again drops by around $6,000 with the loss of greens, but I have a soil building opportunity. So this is another one of those situations that balances revenue and some soil building and some pest management. Cucumbers tend to be a high labor crop. If I have no labor in the wintertime, good news is cover crops are extremely low labor. Now, if we consider the short calendar window, window of cucumbers and the need to generate revenue, same time get some soil health benefits in, we can begin to devise a rotation that has green starting in the early fall, growing for about six months. And then I have a unique window where I could get a cover crop in for about three months in early spring to say the beginning of summer, and then followed by a late season crop of cucumbers. The advantage of this late season crop of cucumbers is that I am having some protection against downy mildew. I'm a little bit beyond some of those early flushes of striped cucumber beetles. So it helps me with my pest, manage, pest and disease management on cucumbers, uh, but I'm still getting the revenue from the greens and the fruiting vegetable and slipping in a very short season cover crop. That short season cover crop needs to be something that puts on biomass fairly quickly in uh, cool to moderate temperatures of April, May, June. I think oats would be a very good candidate here, perhaps combined with a legume, some type of pea or vetch, uh, or perhaps if your soil is warm enough, you could have buckwheat uh, germinate in that situation and put some growth on as well. It's a moderate uh, pest risk with aphids and a moderate soil contribution since it's a shorter term cover crop, but a very respectable revenue contribution in this situation. It's a high labor demand situation due to the greens and cucumbers. Let's continue to be creative and look at, instead of growing greens in the wintertime, can I grow a cover crop? Now, what will strike you with this rotation where the cover crop goes in at the beginning of fall, late September, and has grown until the beginning of spring, late March, my potential revenue did not change from where I had greens. Well, how is that possible? The reason is I follow that cover crop with a three month crop of greens. So you may be asking now, well, how do you get the same amount of revenue from six months of greens versus three months of greens? The answer is heat and light. And so the six months of winter growing, I will suggest I could generate the same amount of revenue out of the three months of April, May, and June with say a lettuce crop or another greens crop. Those are very advantageous months for growing greens. And uh, I would suggest I can get that same revenue in three months that I got in six winter months. I follow that with now a fruiting vegetable, cucumbers again, the short season, and I've achieved a very unique uh, situation here in that I have a 
fairly high potential revenue, moderate to low pest risk in that rotation. And I have an excellent soil building opportunity because I have six months of cover crop growing. So now we're going to watch a video to learn a little bit more about those cover crops. All right, here we are. I'm Justin Reed of the Cornell Vegetable Program. I'm here at one of our cooperating high tunnel greenhouses where we're doing some research on cover crops. And you can see here behind me uh, how much biomass we've created with this cover crop. The concept here is by growing this, we can grow some of our own nitrogen in the wintertime when uh, normally these wouldn't have any crops growing in them. And this way we can reduce our fertilizer inputs once we're up and growing, say, a fruiting vegetable crop like tomatoes. So what we're trying to do is look at different combinations of cover crops, different timings, and different ways to manage it. Boy, this looks beautiful. So behind me, you can see one of our cover crop treatments. This is a combination of triticale and a legume called Austrian uh, winter peas or field peas. And those winter peas, what they can do is fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and add it to the soil. This triticale is a grain, uh, what we call winter grain. It does a fantastic job of scavenging nitrogen that's in the ground and then putting it into this vegetative form. And then this over time is our slow release fertilizer for the vegetable crops that we grow during the warm season. So what our cooperating farmer here intends to do is take all of this cover crop that you see behind me and he's going to incorporate that with a tiller into the soil a couple weeks before he transplants tomatoes. What we're trying to do is really see can we improve our nutrient management here by growing and capturing some of our own uh, nitrogen in this cover crop and thereby adding less fertilizers during the season, hopefully improving profitability for the farmer by decreasing their fertilizer bill and balancing the nutrients that we have in the soil so we have healthier crops. We have multiple treatments here. That's why there's different heights of this cover crop behind me. And what we're doing is measuring how much nutrient uptake is there by this cover crop and how does that translate into crop health, crop yield, nutrient status of our crop. So in a moment I'll take you over to uh, one of our other uh, research high tunnels here where you can see what the tomato crop looks like. Quickly, I would like to talk about those cover crops then and our research updates um, in terms of seeding a cover crop. It's very similar to winter greens in that generally uh, the earlier in September or in October in our research here, we can seed the more biomass we're going to achieve. The total nitrogen we're able to achieve with that cover crop is uh, actually quite high. So in this case, uh, our triticale um, treatments were giving us around 73 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, that's on a per acre basis. And if we think about a tomato crop requiring around uh, 125 or maybe 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, we're getting half, we could get half of our nitrogen from a cover crop. So this brings up the point in one of my slides, I showed a zero for potential revenue for cover crops in a high tunnel or greenhouse rotation. And that's true, there is no revenue associated with it. But if we are using particularly organic fertilizers, the savings that we could be achieving with some of our cover crops is as much as $1,000 or high tunnel. So I'd like to thank the Great Lakes Expo. All right. All right, now I gotta figure out what to, where am I? All right, 
Carla, can I check in with you? Can you hear me okay? Hear you loud and clear. Could you answer a question? I am going to do exactly that. Let's do questions. Excellent. Uh, where would you recommend getting ginger rhizomes? Yeah, ginger rhizomes, There's that's a good question because there's not a lot of places to do that. Um, and sometimes they seem like they're the same place. Um, the names are kind of funny. The first one is, uh, I think it's called Biker Dude. Uh, so you can put that into a search engine, look up Biker Dude Ginger. Uh, the other, I believe, is called North Branch. And almost all the Hawaii you're going, or excuse me, all the ginger you're going to get as, as uh, seed pieces is going to come from Hawaii where there's a commercial industry for it. Um, while I'm on that topic, you don't want to use the ginger <clears throat> that you buy from a store. <clears throat> excuse me, that's generally not viable um, for as a seed piece. Um, so you do need to order it from one of those or any other that I can I can mention, but generally it's going to come from Hawaii. While we're on that topic, uh, germinating ginger or sprouting it is actually what you're doing is also time intensive. I don't mention that uh, in the presentation, but uh, that needs very warm temperatures, generally in the 80s, and those pieces need to be lightly sprinkled with some form of, of potting soil uh, and kept moist so that they actually sprout. They produce uh, tiny new shoots off of those rhizomes, the same ones that uh, we recognize as, as food. Uh, so that's gonna generally require a greenhouse, a heated greenhouse uh, to get those up and going. Okay, and when you plant any of the cover crops, have you done any trials with them to suppress potential weed populations? Boy, that's a great question. The, the, the short answer is no, we're not measuring their ability to suppress weeds, but we definitely are seeing um, some weed suppression. Uh, in the wintertime, if left um, unmanaged, my experience is that high tunnels or soil-based greenhouses will produce some um, fairly aggressive weeds. One in particular is chickweed. Uh, and another to wash out for is bindweed or, or yeah, bindweed morning glory. So by tilling that soil and then putting in the, the winter grain in particular, we're going to outcompete some of those other weeds. Um, so we're not struggling too much with weeds where we're doing this. So I haven't studied it particularly, but anecdotally, I'm seeing good results. Excellent. All right, any other questions? Just use the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself. If not, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Don't worry, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> People paid for an hour of content. I'll give them an hour of content. Okay, here's another one. Uh, is tillage the most common way to terminate cover crops? Another good question. And, and the, the quick answer is, is yes. Um, and we do see some problems with that. So with our cover crops, we are, we're producing a fair amount of biomass, particularly where we're using a row cover. It's like a winter greens grower uses row cover to protect their, their spinach or their lettuce. Um, we're using it to protect our winter grain and uh, field pea. So we get a lot of biomass. First thing we do is actually mow it. Uh, so we mow it so that it's, um, it's gonna decompose quicker. And then we're using a tractor mounted tiller to incorporate that. I can share that um, image real quick. So I think the one thing to bear in mind with this tillage, if I can get there, is that it's hard on the soil structure. So if we have ideas on how we can improve our incorporation of this so that we're not having this much tillage, I, I, I'm all ears because what's happening here is we're probably creating a compaction zone at the bottom of that uh, tillage area where those tines are um, working the soil. Over time, we're going to develop a compaction layer there. Could you use silage tarps in a high tunnel situation? 
I think so. I'm not a, I'm not a tarping expert. You know, that's kind of a new technique in the last few years that people are looking at. My question would be how quickly will that tarp work? Uh, how quickly will it, um, kill that crop? Um, and then I think then the, the research question for me would be at what point do I put in the tarp of course, and how much cover crop biomass can I accumulate prior to doing that? Is it going to be January 1st, February 1st? Um, so that question of when the tarp goes in would be the most important for me. Okay, great. And how do you know if you are buying a good cover crop locally? Well, boy. I, I see Dale is on here. Maybe Dale can answer that better than, than I could. It, it comes down to a few things, which are number one, is the is the cover crop coming from a viable seed producer? And so I prefer working with a, a registered seed company because they're going to have to do germination tests and purity tests on their seed lot, which is very important. Uh, and so what, what is the germination percentage of the, of the cover crop you're buying and um, how, how, um, how pure is it? So how many, how many weed seeds are you buying in? Uh, those are a couple of important things. If you're certified organic, that uh, vastly narrows your choices. You're going to be working with a certified organic seed company. Great. And is there a way to establish a cover crop while tomatoes are still growing? Oh, and I forgot to get Dale's input on that. I'm sorry. Dale, sorry. do you want to tell no, us? No, that's an excellent that's answer. I was going to say, um, you know, consider, you know, buying certified seed or at least from a buying your seed from a, a seedsman versus sort of bin run um, kind of sources. Um, you know, I think you got a high value situation um, and um, introducing problems there end up being high cost problems. Um, a little bit extra seed cost probably is uh, a good, um, you know, a good way to, to avoid problems. Yeah. Okay, Thanks, and so back to that question about establishing a cover crop while tomatoes are still growing. Yeah, well, that's a fascinating concept. Um, it can it can be done. Um, so in that situation, I would envision there not being uh, uh, any any plastic film or plastic mulch on the ground, um, because we would be emitting a lot of the of the high tunnel space if that was down. So that would be the first thing. You'd have to be growing without any mulch on the soil. Um, and then it could be done. You would be doing it at the end of the tomato lifespan. So this puts us into probably September. Um, and then you would have to accommodate for water. You can tell I'm thinking out loud here. So one of the things is that high tunnel soil is very dry. And so to establish the cover crop, I don't go into the details on that here, but very quickly, we use uh, overhead irrigation. We use, a, we use a sprinkler to have the cover crop germinate again, because that soil is so, so dry and drip irrigation is inappropriate because uh, really this is an agronomic crop. It's not in one row, it's broadcast. So, I'm struggling to figure out how I would water in that cover crop with a standing crop of tomatoes in there. Um, it'd be a challenge, it could be done, but I think you'd be better off aggressively harvesting the tomatoes, harvesting all of the mature greens and putting those in a storage space. You can continue to sell those mature greens as they advance to color over several weeks. Um, because they've never been rained on, so they have a very good shelf life. I would take a, I would take the plants out and establish the cover crop. That's my long winding answer to the question. Great answer. Okay, so when, as in what month, was the video shot, video shot showing the triticale field, field peels, field peas under cover cover crop? Could you elaborate on findings with the use of row cover or not? Absolutely. So the the video was shot, I think that was early March, just based on the amount of growth we or probably mid March based. No, it was early March, because we incorporated that um, later in the month and transplanted tomatoes. So that was early March, the sun, you could tell was a little higher. 
uh, and the cover crop was growing. There's not much to elaborate on with the use of row cover aside from our findings show that it significantly contributes to the biomass of the cover crop as well as then the amount of nitrogen that we're fixing or putting into a veg or scavenging too and putting into a vegetative state. So we recommend the row cover. In practice, what we're doing is not putting that on until really early January. Uh, and so here we are doing it again this year. Um, I think uh, our target was last week. The reason being is we're trying to introduce some cold into that tunnel for pest management reasons. So if we were to sow the cover crop, germinate it, have it emerge, and then immediately put the row cover on top, we might be perpetuating some, some particularly insects over the winter and we freezing is our friend. And so that winter temperatures, we wanna introduce some of it. So we're doing cover crop or a row cover, excuse me, in early January. Okay, any more questions? While people are, are maybe thinking or typing those, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit further on that um, issue of timing. And so just like growing winter greens, growing a winter cover crop, the seeding date is really the most important factor. And so the earlier we establish that in the fall, the more growth we, growth we have. And so if I can establish that by October 1st, I'm gonna maximize my, my total uh, biomass. The other option is if you're taking a crop later into the fall, let's say you don't get this um, seeded, the cover crop seeded until November 1st, you can back off your incorporation date a month in the spring. And let's say you incorporate in mid-April, that additional time of waiting in the spring, you can almost catch up with your late planting. Um, so in other words, having the length there, getting some of your fall or some of your late winter, early spring conditions into that cover crop maximizes growth. The other thing I don't think I mentioned is it's important to incorporate this ideally a couple weeks before you transplant because the soil microbes are going to require a fair amount of energy to get to work in the decomposition process. And they can actually compete with your tomato crop or other vegetable crop for free nitrogen in the soil as they do their work to break that down. So give yourself a couple of weeks so that you're not, um, you're not caught in that transplant shock situation. Last chance for questions. Well, you do have a lot of compliments in the chat. People found this very informative and awesome. <laughs>